Anthony. Hi, John. We've known each other for quite a few years, actually. Yeah, 1992, I think. When you were at Theological S College. St John's College That's in Nottingham. Right. That and you, was... came, you came and did a mission. Yes. And I thought, wow, I'm so glad J. John's come to do a mission because I was dying at Theological College, to be honest with you. And it was fantastic that you came in and, and focused us again yeah. on, on outreach. Wow. Well, we've known each other and had various connections over the years. Now, yeah. you, your story, Anthony, you grew up in Manchester. That's right. Yeah, I was brought up working class lad on a council estate in Manchester. Um, my mum worked in a mill, my dad worked in the same mill, my brother ended up leaving school and he went to work in the same mill, and you know, cotton mill. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, but so. you didn't go, you didn't follow that path, you joined the police cadets at 16. Yeah, well I remember going to the mill and it was so noisy and horrible and loud. I went to the careers officer and she said, what do you want to do when you leave? And I said, I'd like to join the police. And she said, you're too small. So I said, well, I'm only 15, I think I'll grow. Yes. And then uh, she said, well, I don't know, uh, why don't you join the mill like your dad and your mum and everybody else? And I said, I don't want to do that, I want to join the police. And she said, no, no, I think you should... And she really pushed me towards that. I disregarded her, I went to join the police cadets, I, I applied for the job, um, I went through various tests to be able to do it. Eventually, I'd put on my on my CV that I like to do magic tricks. Yes. And not brilliantly, but it was an interest that I had. Yes. And um, so this inspector, dual-looking Scotsman, he got out a pack of cards at the end of it. He said, I see you do magic tricks. I said, yeah. He put it on the desk and he said, amaze me. And I had to do a card trick. <laughs> and, and I did this card trick and he said, you've got the job. <laughs> and that really? was, that's how I ended up getting the police cadets because I did a card trick that he, <laughs> he liked. Obviously liked. He obviously liked card that one. Yeah. And then, uh, and so I did that. And then, and, then, and then the careers woman, the woman who told me that I shouldn't do it, shouldn't bother and everything, she then put me up as one of her greatest successes. She said I was the first person she'd ever got in the police. Of course. Of course. Under so her recommendation. I'm very grateful <laughs> very for grateful. all of her encouragement. Now, how many years were you in the police force? Well, I did two years as a police cadet, which was all like outdoor pursuits and, you know, you did like the Snowden Mountain Marathon and all kinds of different things like that. It was great life for a couple of years. And then at 18 and a half, I went properly into the police uh, as a police constable in, in Manchester. That was in October 1983. And uh, pretty much straight into the miners' strike. Um, that was all kicking off just as My I started. And so at 18, 19, I found myself on the front line at Orgreave the day Arthur Scargo was arrested, national news, etc. Yes. And then um, I was working in, in the centre of Manchester, uh, Cheetham Hill, which was one of the roughest areas. I was there for most of my service, spent a short time uh, on tactical aid group, which was like the riot squad, and then I ended up doing some plain clothes work near the end of the police during the time when the Strange Ways riot, people yes. may, have, may remember that was well, Strange, yeah. Strange Ways was my beat at that time. Right. So saw a few kind of moments of significant national history, if you like, from the inside as a police officer. And, uh, and then but I ended up doing 10 years, just short of 10 years properly, as a, as a police officer. So all sorts of experiences. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and having to confront some awkward situations. Yeah, from the... I mean, I, I remember going to marriages that, that were... and, you know, domestic disputes, they would get called, when I was, like, 19, and you'd go in and there'd be people in their 30s who were, you know, all shouting and fighting, and I'd have to go in and give my marriage guidance wisdom. Yes. You know, having, you know, basically not really having many girlfriends. No. <laughs> <laughs> and to try and help people to be able to patch these things up. You know, so... I, and I saw my first dead body when I was, like, 17, a suicide, and... And, you, you know, you really do see the rough parts of life. I saw I was working this really tough beat. There were yes. gangsters, there was guns, um, there, there was, a, you know, a lot of drugs and, and it was the heady days of, of Manchester, yeah. the, the nightclub scene, you know, all the music and all that kind of stuff. So it was, you know, it was interesting times. Now, you weren't brought up as a Christian, Anthony. So no. when did that journey of faith uh, begin to be part of your story? I think when I was about 12 or 13... I decided I was going to give God a chance to show me whether or not he was there. So I decided I was going to do Lent properly, because at my kind of background, really, as a kind of a Roman Catholic, which became a lapsed Catholic, yes. was, was uh, you know, you went to church because you were kind of made to go, and then there came a point at which I didn't have to go and I could go if I wanted to. But to be honest with you, it was really boring. I just thought, why would sure. anybody want to go with this? It just it didn't connect. 
I decided I was going to do Lent. I went along before school. I would go pretty much every day and sit and wait for God to do something. Flash of lightning, angel appearing. What, and like sit in a church? Yeah, I would just sit there during the service. And, and uh, well, they had like a communion service. Yes. I wanted something to connect. I wanted God to make himself real to me. And so, you know, would the statue of Jesus cry or, yes. or something? It was or that kind something. of thing. So you're obviously quite thirsty. Yeah, I was looking. I was interested. Yeah. Well, actually, there was also a sense of because if you're not real, I'll be able to live life my own way. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to make sure. And at the end of Lent, nothing happened. God didn't appear. No, nothing ever spoke to me. So I thought, great. At about 13, I can now live life my own way because there is no God. I started to look into some new agey things. I still like this kind of spirituality thing going yes. on. I'd got to the library, read books on yoga and on, on kind of astral projection and yes. psychics, all this kind of stuff. You know, I was still interested. I think a lot of people have got that kind of spiritual hunger and it's definitely still there. But uh, when I joined the police, my all my hungers, spiritual hungers, pretty much became about just wanting to be the best policeman I could be. And then, right. and then it was all about living the tough life of a cop. And so I ended up, you know, getting very into the big, hard drinking culture. When I was joined the police, it was very much like if, if people have seen the life on Mars. Yes. It was that tough. Was that. You, you know, you fought criminals and yeah. they knew that they'd been fought. There was a, a real, you know, and it was hard drinking. It was like live for the weekend or whenever your, your shifts were off and all that kind of stuff. So, and, and you know, I, I, was a, I was a violent man. I enjoyed the violence. I was pretty good at it. And it was a buzz and, you know, going kicking people's doors in and, and to go and do drugs raids yeah. and having crossbow bolts fired at you and all that kind of stuff. In lots of ways, kind of kept a buzz going in my life that, that most of the time could satisfy me spiritually. Yes. Except those times, because it, there was also a trail of broken relationships, even at a young age, of, of people that I knew I was hurting, etc. And sometimes I'd lie in my bed at night and, you know, either with somebody or on my own and think... What am I doing? And is this really the best that life's got to offer? And I'm being sick down a toilet, and it's just what am I doing? This yes. Is, and just well, the, and you realise there's actually a lot of emptiness in that way of life that makes it feel like it's full, but leaves yeah. you with a ton and of. And a lot of it's done because of peer pressure, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's I'm, not because you choose to do it. It's like, like oh, you feel you've got to do oh, it. The, guy, the guys that I was in the police with, they're great guys, lots of yeah. them, but you know they were all older than me, and I'm 19. The way to impress them was to be the biggest, the loudest, the daftest, the whatever, yeah. and I wanted them their approval. And so I became that guy. So you had this searching yeah. part of within somewhere, you. Somewhere, somewhere it was still there. But I remember thinking, I, I, I don't, and, well, and the last place I would have gone to look was church. Yes. So I, uh, you know, I ended up, you know, in, my community was like working men's clubs and people like that. And actually there's a lot of stuff that goes on in those. People would care for one another and look after yeah. one another in those kind of settings in the north. And so, you know, I was, I'd play snooker and have my mates and all this kind of stuff. So... That was kind of satisfying the community aspect. But then one day, I remember I was playing snooker and a girl walked in and, uh, and I thought, oh, she's nice. And I said to yes. my friend, who's that? And they said, oh, it's such and such. It's called Zoe. She's called yes. Zoe. I thought, oh, she's, she's gorgeous. But yeah. I, anyway, but I thought she's a bit posh, a bit posh for us. And, uh, I've, you know, subsequently, you know, she says she doesn't, but I could see her kind of looking down her nose a bit like that. <laughs> yes. And, looking, and, all, and, and it turns out she was going out with a guy I knew. And I met Zoe and then later on I bumped into her at a nightclub. And, uh, and, I, and I, you know, I thought, oh, she is, she's really nice. And then New Year's Eve, one night, in this nightclub, this girl was there. And, and I thought, it's 12 o'clock, it's going to be the time when people go and do the New Year's yes, hugging a kiss. that's right. This is my moment. So I waited for 12 o'clock, and then she was dancing, and I went over, and, and she turned around, and I gave her one of the three greatest kisses in history. Yes. And, and it was like amazing moment and, and she reciprocated she, uh, she was happy yeah. yes she and was... and um until there's a punch i got punched in the back of the head by her boyfriend by her fiance oh i know fiance uh, fiance yeah she never really wanted to marry him she'll say it, it was me basically gave her a ring and said Let, we're, we're you're, you know we're going to do this and it was sprung her. she never wanted to get married to him anyway to be honest with you um, we both got thrown out by the bouncers me and this guy he was a fireman she was a nurse i was a policeman this is not your normal how a minister meets no. his wife story. No. But uh, we ended up getting thrown out. And then she started. And now this is 1st of January. Uh, yeah, and then yeah. it's 1st of January. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, she's, I like that girl. Anyway, sometime after that, the relationship with this guy broke up. It was doomed to failure anyway, because she was meant to be with me, of course. Yes. And then I, um, I ended up asking her out, and she said no. 
because the reason she was in the club was because she was a backslidden Christian. Right. And the, the way that she, her life was going really in lots of ways was she wasn't really living fully for Jesus. And she'd come to a point of decision, I'm going to live for Jesus. So when I started to ask her out, she said, I'm not going to go out with you. You're not, you're not a Christian. And I was like, no, no, it's a Christian country. Everybody's a Christian. Yes. And she said, um, uh, no. And she explained a little bit of what she believed. And, and then eventually I, I said, I don't understand everything that you're saying, but I, want, I, mean, I thought I'm going to put her off God. So I asked her all the tough questions I could possibly think. Why did, and I, I was there in, in the, the Manchester airport disaster when, you know, oh, yes. horrible things, yes. you see children being, but how can your God allow this kind of thing to happen and all that? And she, she just used to say, it was quite disarming actually, she would say, well, if you don't want to believe it, you don't have to believe it, it's all right. It's really frustrating. Yeah. And uh, eventually she said, well, there's a guy coming speaking at something. You've got all these questions. A guy called Eric Delve. And uh, he's speaking at something. I've got to be at it. If you come to that, he might give you some answers. So I said, I'll do it if I can take you to the pub straight afterwards. Yes, that and she, was a good deal. Yeah, and she said, yeah. So we went along. I heard Eric Delve. Um, and, and this was in Withenshaw. This, it was actually in Glossop. Oh, Glossop. And you were on that mission. I was there. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. And, um, and this is, so what year is this? This was 1986. Okay. And um, I, heard the, I heard the gospel. I'll tell you what, I mean, it blew my mind because I went into a church building where people were friendly and then the music was good. And then there was this drama group, these young people did this fantastic yes. drama. I thought, wow, this is really good. And then the, the person who was introducing everybody was like professional and nice. Yes. And, and I was thinking, oh, I'm wrong about church because church isn't meant to be like this. And then Eric got up and he spoke in his most engaging way yes. and he was funny. And then, bang, he drove the message home about Jesus. Uh, uh, speaking as if Jesus was still alive and yet talking about why he died and about the cross. And he held up this nail and he yeah. said, this is the kind of nail that would have been driven into Jesus Christ because he loves you. And he did this for you. Who would you, who would you lay down your life for? Who would you take a nail for? And it went through my mind, I remember thinking... Well, not Zoe, because I only just met her. Not my dad, because he's tougher than me. He could probably take it better than me anyway. Not my brother, I didn't really like him at the time. Possibly my sister. My mum. I'd do it for my mum. And he said, if you, if you picked anybody, it'd have to be somebody you really, really loved. Jesus loves you like that. Yes. And I remember thinking, this isn't a message I've ever really connected to before, and I need to think about it. And I, and I didn't kind of there and then become a Christian, but it was like that was the hook that sometime later, I was driving to work a few months later and, and became a Christian. What, in the car? Yeah. How? I, well, somebody had given me, I started to go along to a church, the, the, the church that was involved with this mission, and they, somebody gave me a tape and it had Christian music on it. Graeme Kendrick. Oh, yes. The Servant King. Yes. And I liked it. I liked the music. There's a few of the songs that I really liked. And uh, so I wasn't a Christian, but I was starting to listen. And somebody gave me this tape. I don't even know who gave it me. But uh, I was listening to it. And there's a line that came up. And it says, hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. I thought, what was that? <laughs> Wind it back. Because you could do that with yeah, tapes. Yeah, that's right. The good thing about tape. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. And Pow. Uh, it happened. I had, a, I, had a, I had a full on kind of vision of the cross. So first of all, I just knew it was true. I pulled over the side of the road and I just felt the presence of God invading the car. And, and the first thing I thought was, oh no, oh no, Jesus is the Son of God. And it's true. And now all the times I've, 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 I've just, I've even used his, his name. Yes. As, you know, as, as a curse. Yes. And, and tied up dirty words with that name. And, and, and I've, and I've thought, and I thought, he knows about that, and he knows about him, and he knows about her, and he knows about them, and he knows about that. And I felt, I mean, literally covered in, covered in filth, covered, covered in shame. I felt, I felt dirty. I felt a mess. And it was like, as the, just as, and it was like that, go away from me, God, I'm a sinful man. And then just as I started to feel like the worst thing ever, and the worst person ever born, and desperately in need, suddenly I felt waves of love and grace and and peace and Jesus just came to me and said it's all right and you're my son and I love you and uh and and, and just recreated and I sat there and just cried I in the car I on your cried. own I hadn't cried since I was oh, I can't remember but no you'd have to hit me really hard to make but me cry. you started sobbing <laughs> and just it just touched my heart and they're almost like cleansing tears and oh just release ev ev relief. everything everything changed before that you see I'd said to Zoe on a few occasions oh no I'm a Christian I'm a Christian 
and she knew that I wasn't. But I went, uh, well, I got into work late. Yes. And I went into the, sar and the sergeant and said, what are you doing late? What are you doing? And I said, I'm a Christian, Sarge. He said, well, you're not a very good Christian, you're late. <laughs> late for work. <laughs> so you came out with it straight away. Yeah, I knew. Because you knew I'm a Christian I knew, now. I knew. I, knew. I, bet, so I just met says, with Jesus. So you I'm a Christian. And then, and then I rang Zoe and I said, I've, I've just given my life to Jesus. He just met me and, and it was like a... I think it was And a, she knew when she met she you. She knew the difference immediately. She knew this is real. And it was like, you know, the, not the road to Damascus. It was a road, road through Gorton, road through a plate for Jesus... Just turn the course of my life around. I've had this that undeniable meeting with Jesus experience. Where, yeah. And I knew, and I th the first thing I thought was, oh, no, I'm going I'm to have to leave the police because I can't possibly, I couldn't stay in the police and be the person I was in the police yes. now that I knew Jesus. And then, thankfully, there's a great thing called the Christian Police Association. Yeah. And I met with some people involved with that and was able to get some Bible study encouragement from other guys. And, and so I stayed in the police as... For a further how many... Well, I, I, I mean, I was in the police as a Christian for about seven years. Right. And people began to see the change. And then, and then I, got, I got a call for ministry. So the, the change that they noticed, Anthony, what would that have been in your manner, in the way that you dealt with people? Well, I, I mean, I went mad for the Christian stickers all over the back of the car thing. Yeah. I like that. I mean, uh, we're on UCB. I remember UCB and, and was on. I had a UCB sticker. I had the Christian fish. I had the Maranatha. I had all of these kind of things. Yeah. I was thinking, that's a good way of doing it. Fill your car up with pictures of Jesus. I did that for a bit. It didn't really work. I mean, people just thought, what's going on there? Yeah. Then I bought the fish uh, badge. Yeah. But I'll put that on my tie. Yes. That'd be good. And then people will ask me. And uh, I remember I, I wore it. And then I, and, but the thing was, because I was a still a pretty unredeemed Christian, instead of a lot going wrong in my life, and was from a, a big family of swearers and a big background of, you know, in the police of, of you know, a lot of swearing. Sure. It took a while between yeah, to you and adjust. me. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I remember, like, uh, at one point, I was in the parade room, which is when everybody comes mm -hmm. in. And, and I thought, I had this moment, I, and somebody will ask me, there'll just be two of us in a panda car. And somebody will say, what's that? fish about and then I'll kind of explain yeah. so that's what I'd anyway I was in there's about 50 policemen and everybody's grumpy and tired and drinking lots of coffee and, and then suddenly the inspector looked across and he said that fish Delaney and pointed to it on my tie and I felt it go boom 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 and it's like every eye turned on me and I was thinking this is the wrong moment yes this isn't now I don't want to this is they, they're gonna kill me and uh, I was thinking Lord no please don't make it now and then the, the inspector said I didn't know you were interested in angling. <laughs> Did he? He said, can we speak to me afterwards? We can join the angling section. <laughs> oh, so I got let off the hook. That, yes. But then slowly but surely, it was more with guys that I was working with. Yes. They saw the change. I was still, I mean, it's still a tough job. So when you met with him afterwards, did you then say, well, oh, actually, I, I don't think, I'm uh, angling yeah, for yeah, something else? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> After a bit. I ended up, you know, there was occasions, I remember once, going up plain clothes, we had to, had to basically, they had a thing called the donga, which I love doing that. It's the, you know, this is the big battering ram that you knock the doors in with. Yeah. I liked that job. Yeah. I, and so I did that one, and went smashing through the door. And then as I went through, there's this guy in the hallway, and he kind of came at me, and I, and I punched him. I used to do a bit of boxing, so I gave him a good punch. And... You know, it was basically because I thought he was he was coming to get me. Sure. And uh, anyway, I ended up chatting with him, and and, and and this guy was in on drugs, and and I ended up praying with him before the end of the day, and things like this. Oh. And then one of the guys, the, the, the sergeant, said, "Look, we've got a Christian policeman. He punches them and then prays for them." <laughs> so um, the punching, praying policeman. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I. Um, but Zoe, she obviously saw the change in you. Yeah. And then did you start dating yes. soon after? Yes, soon after. As we got married really soon afterwards yep. as well. And, and it's the, you know, the best thing. You know, Zoe's the, Zoe and Jesus are the best thing that ever happened well, to Well, interesting. Me. Jesus is about life. And then Zoe, her name means life. So yeah. you've got life and life. Absolutely. Well, she, I remember her saying to me years before, and I think it's good advice. She, she said to me, well, not years before, months before, she said, I would, I, I would never marry anybody who didn't love Jesus more than they love me. And when she said it, I said... I don't understand that. I don't know what you mean at all. Yeah. But now I know. Of course. And you know, that's the right priority is to get... Absolutely. Uh, you know, put Jesus at the centre. And uh, so just over 25 years ago, we got married and, uh, that, and now we've got three fantastic children, growing up, grown-up children and, uh, and a grandson. So you've got the silver medal... So you're yeah. going for gold. Going for gold, absolutely. So you started to feel, uh, within the police force, 
at some point mm. that it was time to move on. Yes. When did you kind of discern that and how did you know God was calling you into the ministry? I went in the Pentecostal church and I didn't normally go in those kind of places. They're a bit scary, you know, I was an Anglican and everything. But this wild-eyed man came up to me and he pointed at me and he said, God says if you don't do anything for these young people, nobody else will. And then he walked off. And I said to Zoe, what's that? Who was that man that just said that? And she said, oh, he's mad, leave it. Yeah, don't worry, it's just because it's that kind of a church. Within a week, the, the, a guy who'd been running the Christian mm. Union in a local school, he ran off with somebody else's wife. And there was all these young people who needed somebody to go yes. in and disciple them. Yes. And I knew it was me. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I started to go in. And I went into this school and I started to get more and more involved with youth mission. I was involved with, there's a thing called The Message in Manchester, which now, when it first started out, I got the message to come into my local school and do right. some things. And I started to feel more and more... I love this kind of stuff. Yes. And I started to, and I started, they invited me to do assemblies in the schools and to stand in front of people and start to talk to them about Jesus mm. more and more. I, as a policeman as who a, is a Christian. They, they invited me, oh, is, is a Christian policeman who's yes. going to come and talk to us about his faith and things. Sure. And then um, people started saying to me, you could be a vicar. I'm like, I don't want to be a vicar. You could be a vicar. I don't want to be a vicar. And carried on like this, a few people. And then one day I, I, I decided, well, I, I, it's funny, I prayed about the future and I was thinking, if I'm going to be a policeman and stay in, I want to be the best policeman I can be. Sure. I want to be a, a, a person that getting up the ranks or something. So I decided I was going to read and study for being a sergeant then to go up the ranks. And you had to memorise a book about this thick, pretty much. So a friend of mine said he was going to give me the book. I went and prayed about it in the bath and really my prayer was, God, give me success in my plan. I wasn't asking God for his plan. I was saying, he is mine, please bless sure. him. And then I went into the bedroom. And as I went into the bedroom, it's, it's going to sound like this is the kind of thing that happens a lot. It doesn't really. But on the second occasion, yes. the presence of God in the room. Jesus this, it was there. This like thing. when you were in the car. Yes. I, I just ended up on my face and, and weeping. And, and in that time, God said to me that he wanted me to study the word of God and to become a student of the Bible. And it was like, yes. instead of memorising, studying that book for the police, I want you to devote the same energy and effort to studying my, my word. And so I committed myself and I actually read, I, was, I became like a Bible monster, 12 chapters a day, yeah. no matter what shift I was doing. And for years, I just studied the Bible and studied the Bible, knowing God was preparing me for something. Never expected it to be a vicar thing. Turned up to all these vicar interviews that got arranged for me and was just fully honest. And when they said to me, why do you want to become a vicar? I was saying, I don't think I do want to become a vicar, really. I'm just here checking it out. And then thought they'd say no, and they opened the door. And then I went to another one and thought they'd say no, and they opened the door. And then one day was the most surprised man ever yeah. when a bishop rang me and said, you've been accepted for training in the Church yes. of England. And that was it. And that was it. So then you went off to theological college. You yeah. studied theology. Three years, yeah. And then you uh, were a curate. In Devon. In Devon. Yeah. And then you went back to be a curate to Eric Dell. That's right. Yeah, the, at St Luke's in uh, Maystow, with the guy who had first heard the gospel through, which was phenomenal. Amazing. And, and then it, after that, yeah. you became a vicar. Rector of a parish in West Horsley in Surrey for eight years. And uh, took that church and kind of grew it out of its building, started to meet in other places. To be honest with you, came up against some of the frustration that I think sometimes can be in Church of England because I ended up going outside the parish system because we didn't have anywhere big enough in our yes. parish to meet. So we had to meet in other places and we, and we did that and kept growing the church. But the system, maybe it's freeing up a bit now, but the system then kind of frowned very much upon that and certainly didn't do anything to release it. And I felt just frustrated as a guy trying to grow a church that yeah. ordinary people would want to come to. And they were... But because it, we were meeting in other people's parishes, sure, it, it was uh, like you became like you know, yeah, it's under a cloud. But now yeah. you're the minister of Ivy Manchester. Yeah. So how long have you been the minister at Ivy? Just nearly five years. Um, we, I came to the, the point actually. You came to West Horsley, John. You, you did our, our best Christmas ever. I you remember. came and you spoke and we had hundreds of people yeah. came, a massive response. So in lots of ways, what you would think would be the best possible time, like yes. the, 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 the zenith, if you like, yes. of that time, at that point, God was saying to me, I, I need you to move on, I want you to move on. Yes. And I was like, oh, wow. And I was checking it out, and then around that time, I saw this advert for Ivy Cottage, as it was then called. This church in Manchester had a good reputation. And I went to Manchester and I had a call, a full-on definite yes. dreams. Where God said to me, this is it. 
I want you to be here. And we responded to that call and went down there and it has been just a, a, the most amazing ride. Tell us a little bit about your church. Well, What's happening? Well, it, it's basically burst out of the original church building, which was, uh, you know, 100 and odd years old. It met for two morning services. You get a few hundred people coming on. So it's a, it's a good church, good teaching, good, you know, renewal church, etc. But uh, they wanted me to come because they knew they kind of were turning inwards. Yeah. So I've gone and helped them to turn outwards and to face outwards. And so we changed the name from Ivy Cottage, yes. which is the old historical name, to Ivy Manchester and said, we're here for the city. And then we've started to, well, as we grew, we realised we've we come to a point of growing that we need to move out and we need to make a brave decision. Yes. So we moved out of the building and we started to meet in other places. So for 18 months, we moved around the city. We met in Gorton Monastery, we met in the Trafford Centre, we met in some, uh, some cinema in Salford. And then we've now moved... Uh, to Cine World, our main service meets in the, the biggest screen in our local Cine World. Yes. Plus, we hire another three screens and they give us some other areas for our children's and youth work and all Wonderful. that kind of stuff. That's our main service and it's great because we move there thinking we'll have plenty of room. The sure. problem is we're now packed out again and we're going to have to, we're going to, have to put in other screens. And we've planted two churches in the last year it's on amazing. top of that. And now we're uh, going to do an... E we've, the only thing that happens in the existing building is an evening service, but our right. other services, one meets in yeah. a warehouse, real focus on people coming out of prison and people on a council estate with Shaw, the biggest council estate in Europe. Mm. And the other one meets in a nightclub, reaching out to students in Manchester University. Fantastic. So it's a very creative, mm. caring church mm. that's really committed to reaching out to people. Well, our, our vision really, somebody asked me what it was, and it's to try and make Jesus accessible. I think... Yeah, to the, the outsiders. Thing, yeah, I mean, I remember when you came to that mission, you, yeah. I remember you doing a brilliant thing about how our preaching needs to be something that's accessible to ordinary people. And you did a thing about the signs outside the church yeah. and, you know, God wants you to be a titus or something that's like that. That's right, and I, yeah. this, I remember thinking, that's so true. My background is somebody who didn't come to church and yes. thought, what goes on through those strange doors? And, and there's such a massive barrier for people to come into church. I want the church to be, you know, we, we're a really high bar on discipleship. You know, follow yeah. Jesus Christ, lay down your life, take up your cross, be sacrificial, be loving, be generous. But we want it to be easy for people to connect to Jesus, to understand. So let's explain things. Yes. Let's talk, do this profound things simply so yes. people can get them. Jesus talked about sheep and Absolutely. pictures people got. So let's let's do that. And, then, and we want, so if we're going to do things, we'll, we'll do things really as excellently as we can. We'll be adventurous and we'll try new things because the only failure is sure. not trying. And we're just going to keep on... Basically, in our church, if, we, if somebody comes to me and says, I've got an idea that I think might reach some people, the answer's yes. Let's go and let's give it a go. Let's explore let's, it. Let's go and seek and save the lost. And when we do that, you know, I think God's looking for people in churches that are willing to give things a go that are going to help sure. to connect ordinary people back to him because that's his heart. Anthony, to, if anyone wants to know more about you and Ivy Manchester... IvyManchester.org. And I also do a blog, AnthonyDelaney.com. Um, where I put my ramblings on there occasionally too. Anthony, it's a delight to hear a little bit more about your story. Uh, you're truly uh, a pastor, teacher and uh, an evangelist. And uh, well, it's great to hear what you're doing at Ivy Manchester. Thank you. But it's great also that you're a person who thinks globally. Mm -hmm but also acts locally. Well, I, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you, John, for your encouragement of me over the years and the time that you've invested and spent in me. It's meant a, a great deal and continues to, so thank you. Well, value you very much. Thanks very much, Anthony. Thank you.